This episode is about human knowledge that was lost. The first story is about a man who had no background in architecture and yet he built the largest dome of the 15th century. And even today, engineers are trying to find out how he did it. The second story is about a mechanism that was found on the bottom of the sea. We know that it was built around the 2nd century BCE. However, this kind of mechanism should not have existed until 10 centuries later. So, the order of things is all mixed up. Therefore, in this episode, I'd like to share with you several books about human knowledge that was lost and rediscovered. Welcome back to Bold Books and Bones. The first book I love to share with you was written by Ross King and is one of my all-time favorites. He tells in a compelling way the story about the dome of this cathedral. It is the Santa Maria del Fiore in the beautiful city called Florence, Italy. When in the 13th century Florence decided to build a cathedral, they organized a competition where people were asked to design their best version of a cathedral and to build a model of it that they then could showcase to a jury. The winning model had this enormous dome on top of it. However, there was one slight problem. Nobody knew how to build such a large dome. One way to build a rather small dome was to make a heap of sand then correctly positioning the stones on and around it. And then you remove the sand. If everything was correctly executed, the structure then holds itself and you would have a dome. However, it was completely impossible to use this technique to build such an enormous structure It was just not possible to provide this vast amount of sand or any other internal support structure. So what to do? The reasoning at the time was that since it would take more than a hundred years before they would start to build the dome, by then, they assumed, someone would have figured out how to do it. Now, time passed fast. The first stone of the cathedral was laid at the end of the 13th century. But then, in the 15th century, the method to build the dome was still not known. And again, a competition was organized in Firenze. One man called Filippo Brunelleschi claimed to know how to do it. But he was not keen to reveal his method. This wonderful book by Ross King that tells the full story is called Brunelleschi's Dome. And what I like very much about all the books by Ross King that I read so far is that they are character driven. We learn about history through how it unfolds during the lifetime of a person. In this case, during the lifetime of Filippo Brunelleschi. This approach used by the author is, I think, a great way of teaching history and of telling stories in general. I particularly like in this book the part where Ross King makes us aware that large domes had existed before the one of Florence was built. However, we humans lost the knowledge of how to do it. This is another example of how fragile human knowledge is. There are so many instances throughout time where we lost valuable knowledge that was written down on papyrus, in manuscripts or printed in books. The reason is that these documents were unintentionally or intentionally destroyed by fire, by water or by general neglect. 
If you want to know more about the destruction of written knowledge, then you can find links to several episodes of Bold Books and Bones about this topic in the comment section. Now, back to the great book by Ross King. How did Brunelleschi solve the dome problem? Well, without spoiling the story, the clue lays in studying the remains of the architecture of the ancient world. Many examples of it could be found in Rome, but the Eternal City was in those days not a very inspiring sight. Once more than one million people lived in Rome. However, in 1348, the Black Death had reduced its population to about 20,000 people. And the streets were filthy and unsafe. Many of its great ancient monuments, like famous temples, were destroyed or changed their function. Some of them became even cow stalls. One of them was the famous Pantheon. And by studying all these buildings, or what was left of them, Brunelleschi discovered a way to build the enormous dome without any internal support structure. In this book by Ross King, we learn about who this man was that had no background in architecture and yet was entrusted with this spectacular and daring building project. We learn about the fascinating method that he used, about the support and trust he received, and how he was mistrusted and even envied by others. The irony of it all is maybe that we don't have any writings or plans that were made by Filippo Brunelleschi. So we could say that in this case, history repeats itself. Therefore, this book is, at least to me, also the story of the importance of preserving our human knowledge from the past. We might think that things are different now because we have everything digitalized and safe and secured in the cloud. But that is just an illusion because if we look at the research of the United Kingdom web archive, about the stability of URLs on the web, then they found that about 40% of the URLs are missing after just three years. The technical term for this phenomenon is apparently called link rot. And that has a lot of implications for our societies, our political systems, the protection of our democracies and the protection of our communities. You can find the link to the UK Web Archive study in collaboration with the British Library in the comment section underneath this episode. These and other studies indicate that we humans continue to struggle with how to store, secure and preserve our common and valuable human knowledge. second book called Decoding the Heavens was written by Joe Marchant and tells us another true and extraordinary story. More than 2000 years ago, a ship filled with precious cargo sank near the coast of the tiny Greek island called Antikythera. Now, next to the bronze statues and other artifacts, this ship also contained an extraordinary little device, not much bigger than a book. And while the ship was sinking, this device fell silently on the floor of the sea. It stayed there about 20 centuries, and it started to slowly disintegrate. Then, in 1901, a sponge diver discovered by accident the shipwreck and its treasures of statues and vases, but he also found what looked like a corroded chunk of metal. And he brought it to the surface. 
Now, at first, not much attention was paid to this object, and it was laying somewhere in a storage place in the museum in Athens. Until one day, someone picked it up and noticed something unusual about it. This object seemed to contain gears. Now, that was actually not possible, because gears were something from a much later time. If this was true, then it meant that we humans would have to re-evaluate the way we look at the history of technology. Jo Marchand reconstructs in her book the whole history of this remarkable discovery. And she tells the fascinating story that it took us humans more than a hundred years since this device had surfaced to understand how it actually worked and what it was meant to do. This search still continues to this day, as the cover story of this January 2022 edition of Scientific American shows. At first, researchers could only study this highly damaged and corroded object by inspecting its surface. But then we learn from Jo Marchand's book how the progress in the development of the 20th and 21st century imaging technology made it possible to look inside the device, like this scan beautifully shows. And look what they found. A first thing was the confirmation of the existence of more gears inside the device. And secondly, they found more than 2,000 written Greek characters that gave important information about this device. Some of this text even gives clear instructions on how to use it. What is known so far is that this device predicts, among others, the positions of planets. And it predicts when eclipses will occur. The several attempts to reconstruct the device with real 3D models confirm these hypotheses. From all the research done on this project, it became clear by the many scholars that were involved that this little machine was the oldest known analog computer. That is to say the least spectacular. I very much enjoyed reading Jo Marchand's book because it's not a sterile and technical account of an archaeological discovery. Instead, she tells it as a fascinating human story. We learn about the sponge divers who found the object. We learn about the many researchers and their efforts to unravel the mystery of this device. We learn about their passion and dedication but we also learn, unfortunately, about intrigue, jealousy, betrayal and bullying among some of the scientists. And she even shares some well-founded hypothesis on who might have built this device. Many questions about this extraordinary object that should not have existed 2000 years ago are still unanswered to this day. Why is it the only device of its kind that we have found so far. Why did this extraordinary human knowledge of gears seems to have disappeared for centuries? But then there are several ancient texts who mention the existence of devices that might fit the description of an Antikythera mechanism-like device. For example, there is this quote by Cicero, who lived in the 1st century BC. So the timing would fit, and he writes in his work On the Nature of the Gods, Book 2, Chapter 34, and he just mentioned it as a part of a point he wants to make about something else. The text goes as follows. Why, if anyone were to carry into Scythia or Britain the globe which our friend Posidonius has lately constructed, each one of the turnings of which brings about the same movements in the sun and moon and five wandering stars, as is brought about each day and night in the heavens. No one in those barbarous countries would doubt that that globe was the work of intelligence. 
So maybe there were several of such devices existing and maybe there are more to be discovered yet. What I think both books illustrate very clearly is how human knowledge often hangs on a thin thread. It is fragile and it doesn't take much to lose essential human knowledge from one generation or from one civilization to the next. That is why preservation of knowledge is so essential and in my opinion gets too little attention these days. I hope you are as fascinated as me by what Ross King and Yo Marchant share in their remarkable books. Thank you for watching this episode of Bold Books and Bones. Looking forward to meet you again at this channel and in the meanwhile, please stay curious and stay free. Bye for now.